Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of Batcast. Today, we are glad to welcome back Dr. Emma Fard, who is the professor of pathology at University of Pennsylvania. Today, she is going to give a presentation on liver transplantation, which she has entitled Key Issues and Logical Approaches in Liver Transplantation. And thanks again. Dr. Fart for joining us and thanks to all of our viewers for uh, tuning in. And as always, please feel free to post your questions or comments on both Facebook chat window as well as YouTube windows. And Dr. Fart will answer your questions at the end of the session. Over to Dr. Fart now. Okay, well, uh, today uh, we're going to talk about liver transplantation. And this will bring together a lot of the um, information in our logical approach that we've developed over the first three pathcasts in terms of liver uh, analysis. We'll introduce a few new topics today, and that is uh, liver malignancies, which have an impact in terms of whether or not a patient is able to be um, undergo liver transplantation. The first slide that I'm showing you, I show the liver as this triangle, and underneath there I have eight to 12 hours, three years, and less than 40%. What this represents is in the United States that the liver can be out of the donor for at most eight to 12 hours. Three years refers to that the median time that a patient with liver disease is on the wait list for liver transplantation, assuming they even get to the wait list, is three years. And the less than 40% represents of those patients that are on the wait list for liver transplantation, less than 40% actually are fortunate enough to obtain a new liver. So with that in mind, what I'm going to do today is take you through the time period, the whole story of a patient with liver disease. And specifically, a patient with liver disease has to first recognize that they have liver disease. And we know that patients with liver disease, particularly hepatitis C, even hepatitis B, and even other chronic hepatitis, may not even realize that they have ongoing liver disease until it's uh, quite advanced in terms of injuring the liver. So the first thing is that the patient has to recognize that they have a problem. The next thing is that the patient has to have access to a health care for which liver transplantation is an option. And I fully recognize that we are fortunate in this country in terms of liver transplantations and other organ transplantations. And such is not the case necessarily in many parts of the world. So I fully want to just recognize the misallocation of resources depending upon what part of the world one lives. That being said, when a patient seeks medical care for their liver disease, they are evaluated for their liver disease. And that evaluation takes into account many things which will determine whether or not they are eligible to even can be considered for a liver transplantation. And at that point, then they are put on the wait list. If they're fortunate then to be able to get a new liver, the donor liver is evaluated by the surgeon and the pathologist. And we'll get into what types of important features we evaluate in terms of liver donor biopsy. And then the, the patient undergoes liver transplantation surgery. What impacts the overall outcome of patients with liver disease and liver transplantation is their underlying diagnosis of their native liver. And we'll, we'll see how that impacts long-term outcome. Then postoperatively, there are many problems that may occur in this patient population. 
So let's take a look at the overall timeline of what we're, we are discussing here. Patients recognize they have liver disease, come in for evaluation, and then they're evaluated whether or not to be put on the wait list. Then a donor liver is identified, it is put in the patient, and then the graph that I show you on the bottom right shows the time period of the various issues that may arise in a patient with liver transplantation. One of the big problems that occurs is recurrent disease, and we'll get into what disease recurs or not recurs. Rejection is an important issue that may develop in this patient population, both acute cellular and chronic rejection. And you see that both acute and chronic rejections are most probable within the first year post-transplantation. Graft loss becomes a major problem years out, and this may be due to recurrent disease, rejection, um, and acquired disease. So today we're going to develop a very dynamic approach to helping and evaluating our liver transplant patient. And as always, we will come down to the fundamental mechanisms and how we can derive the features that we see in understanding the outcomes and how we evaluate the pathology for liver transplantation patients. And I cannot stress this enough, but we as pathologists play an incredibly important role in patient care in this population as well as others. And I'm fortunate to be an academic center and feel very fortunate to be able to help care for these patients and serve with a group effort in terms of moving the field forward and understanding what are some of the key issues and how we should go about caring for our patients. Here's the bottom line of what I'd like you to come away with understanding. Again, mechanisms are key. Fibrosis, fibrosis in the liver is plastic. It's not a static or completely linear process. It can undergo regression. Thirdly, not all hepatocellular carcinomas are the same. And this is important in terms of whether or not a patient is able to be put on transplantation wait list and understanding if they have a hepatocellular carcinoma, what the long-term outcome of that recurrent disease will be. I want to also show you that immediate and early events in the, in the post-transplant time course have actually long-term consequences. I will show you that acute cellular rejection has differing forms with differing clinical outcomes. And then Acute rejection may lead to chronic rejection. So the more acute and severity of acute rejection episodes you have, the more probable you will develop chronic rejection. And hence, that's why both acute and chronic are graphed together most probable within the first year. Recurrent disease in situations is also a problem. So postoperatively, we worry about disease recurrence. And having to understand disease recurrence is predicated on our understanding what the original disease is to begin with. We worry about rejection. We worry about the anastomotic problems, be they biliary and vascular problems. And of course, there are numerous immunosuppressive issues that come about in this patient population. So, again, here is the timeline of the issues that we will be discussing with our patients today. So we in pathology serve an incredibly key role. We make diagnosis, which impacts treatment and prognosis. Our diagnosis and the way we evaluate the liver biopsy and the native explanted liver have predictors in terms of long-term outcome of the patient. And it affords us an opportunity to understand the mechanisms. And so when I approach liver pathology, I like to break it down into what I'm looking at in terms of the liver. Is it a, just a static process, i.e. our usual practice? 
But I think we need to do better and move forward because what we see has long-term outcomes and therefore it could be a predictive or almost biomarker type of process. And I'll show you how that works. And we enter into the clinical treatment realm based upon our diagnosis and therefore it's a very interactive with the clinical care team. And as such, we are true physicians. And I always stop and am just amazed at each and every time I evaluate livers. And I ask myself the question, well, what is this and why is this? And so bringing the critical thinking and investigation skills is something that we in pathology do do all the time. So this is really important in terms of our liver transplantation population. So we discuss that patients with liver disease first have to recognize they have liver disease and then have to gain access to medical care where they may be evaluated for whether or not they are eligible to be put um, on the wait list for liver transplantation. And this is an incredibly important part of the equation. And the patient's selection as to whether or not they are eligible for undergoing liver transplantation is predicated on a few variables. One is what their underlying disease is. So for example, if a patient has alcoholic liver disease and they are still um, drinking, well, they're not going to be eligible for a liver transplantation until they have undergone various interventions for cessation of their drinking and therefore compliance. There's a whole social evaluation that is done. What is the care team, what are the support structures that exist for a patient? And it's really an incredibly team effort to take care of these patients, both from a medical standpoint, as well as from a social network and family standpoint. As well, malignancies in the liver are a key driving factor to the determination for eligibility for liver transplantation. For example, patients with cholangiocarcinoma, except in rare circumstances, are not eligible for liver transplantation. Patients with hepatocellular carcinoma may be eligible for liver transplantation, depending upon the size and number of lesions. So who comes to liver transplantations? Well, patients with chronic liver disease. For example, patients with Wilson's disease may undergo liver transplantation. And as I go through each of these diseases, I want you to ask yourself which of these diseases may recur post-transplantation, and more importantly, what the underlying mechanism is for the recurrence or non-recurrence. Primary biliary cholangitis will lead to cirrhosis and, ne and necessitate a liver transplantation. Autoimmune hepatitis, hemochromatosis, viral hepatitis C. All of these diseases, including viral hepatitis B, and of course, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and alcoholic fatty liver disease, can lead to chronic damage of the liver, leading to cirrhosis, which impedes its function, synthetic, as well as clearing function, which will lead to the decrement of the patient's well-being. And these features, therefore, are evaluated for the potential eligibility for liver transplantation. Now, patients with acute liver disease are also eligible for liver transplantation. So for example, here is acute liver disease due to a acetaminophen overdose. And this was from a patient that um, took this as a suicidal attempt, and this patient was eligible for liver transplantation given the acuity of the process. If they weren't going to give a liver transplantation, they would die, but certainly postoperative, given what had given rise to the liver disease, uh, psychologic intervention and other support systems would be in play to address their original problem or disease that led to the taking of this disastrous medication at that dose. Given that liver transplantation is a very 
scarce resource and not everyone is eligible or has access to that, first of all. And secondly, given that there aren't enough livers to even supply all the patients that may be eligible for liver transplantations, there are criteria that are given for the allocation of these livers based upon the severity of the disease, as well as the presence or absence of hepatocellular carcinoma. I'm showing you here that some of the allocation that is given for hepatocellular carcinoma, and this is all based upon radiologic diagnosis, nothing to do with pathology at this point. This is all radiology driven that the allocation is based upon certain criteria. One of them is called the long criteria. And this says that patients can have a, have a, a certain one size tumor, one tumor that's five centimeters or less, or three distinct tumors, each of under three centimeters. Now, the reason for this is that we're trying to balance the allocation of the scarce resource with the probability of having the recurrent disease, in this case, the hepatocellular carcinoma. And if one has a larger size tumor or multiple hepatocellular carcinomas of a larger size, the probability of having recurrent hepatocellular carcinoma post transplant definitely increases compared to if one is within the stated criteria that I show here. Now, again, all of this is based upon radiology, diagnosis of the size and even what the lesion is in terms of their LIRAD score for the probability of diagnosing hepatocellular carcinoma. When a patient has a lesion detected by radiology that is determined to be hepatocellular carcinoma, the interventional radiologist tries to keep the patient within the criteria. Again, given the patients are on the wait list for at least three years, you have a hepatocellular carcinoma, it's, it's going to grow over time. So they intervene by doing various types of radioembolization procedures, not to try to cure the tumor because that doesn't happen, but at least to try to mitigate its growth to keep them within the criteria of the Milan criteria. However, over time, some of those patients may become out of criteria as their tumor grows, or it could be with that intervention of interventional radiology to try to kill the tumor, it may shrink sufficiently that now they are within the criteria. So the interventional radiology team plays a key role in trying to take care of these tumors within the patient population. Now, all of these lesions are for the most part diagnosed by radiology and they see a lesion in the liver and there's always a question should we biopsy all of these lesions do a fine needle aspiration and radiology is really driving the diagnosis here for the most part they are pretty good about diagnosing hepatocellular carcinoma but they're not perfect and a lot of the studies that have come out of at least our institution have shown that while they're pretty good, there are certain times when they may make a false positive or false negative call once we clearly evaluate the explanted liver. That being said, this is the modality by which their detection and diagnosis of malignant lesions are done with the, with our, within our country at this moment. Now, given a tumor, hepatocellular carcinoma, we talked about the size and number under the Milan criteria, but there is another criteria that will negate somebody being able to be on the wait list for liver transplantation, and that is major vascular invasion. And radiology, again, is really good about being able to detect and determine that type of invasion. Again, not perfect. I show you here. Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma that has just totally invaded the portal vein. And this clearly would be a, a problem and would, this patient would not be eligible for liver transplantation. Now, when we get the liver explant for our pathologic evaluation, not only do the radiology folks have a difficulty in determining the diagnosis and detecting the lesions, 
their size cutoff is basically anything one centimeter below they won't be able to see by their radiology. But when we get the liver and start to section it thinly and we see a nodule such as this, our job is to determine what the diagnosis of these lesions are. So in our institution, we are very uh, much pro about submitting all of these lesions so that we can determine what these lesions are in terms of benignancy or malignancy. Now, here is a usual typical hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, you can see here its, its size. We determine the size, of course, uh, by the ruler on, on pathology. A lot of the time, the size may be very concordant with radiology. Sometimes it's not. And that may be due to a number of factors, one of them being the time of the imaging versus when they were transplanted. And I show you that the arrow shows uh, an area with vascular invasion. Now, it's not large enough to be considered major vascular invasion. But our role, our job with these tumors is to A, diagnose them, and B, stage them, as well as determine the degree of vascular invasion, which is predicated on generous sampling of the area around the tumor. Okay. Here's a patient that underwent liver transplantation. And on radiology, they saw no lesions. The patient had chronic liver disease. They really didn't know what the ideology was. They were deteriorating. And they underwent liver transplantation. So I show you the gross picture of this. And now we'll take this and we'll slice it. And I'll show you the cut section of this liver. I think you can see that it looks fairly nodular as any cirrhotic liver does. However, under the microscope, this, you can see that there are numerous areas of hepatocellular carcinoma just diffusely invading throughout the entire liver. And I show you a higher magnification here. So radiology didn't determine a lesion. We didn't see a discrete lesion, but yet the liver is riddled with hepatocellular carcinoma. When I saw this, this case the first time, I, I thought, my gosh, this patient's going to do horribly. But it turns out that this very rare type of hepatocellular carcinoma, the diffuse cirrhosis-like hepatocellular carcinoma, is actually, in terms of long-term outcome, not as bad as one would have thought. And this is fascinating because if the patient had, for some other reason, undergone a liver transplant biopsy, he was seeing cancer, and maybe the patient would have said, oh, my gosh, you know, this, this patient is not eligible for liver transplantation. But this is a very rare but specific form of hepatocellular carcinoma that does well after liver transplantation. In contrast, I show you three situations here. C represents the situation that I just saw, a liver that on radiology, no lesions were detected in the patient. Uh, a shows a solitary lesion that is diagnosed by radiology as hepatocellular carcinoma. And B shows a seemingly isolated lesion that on radiology would look pretty much like A in terms of, first of all, diagnosing hepatocellular carcinoma, but secondly, the size would be on radiology fairly equivalent to that of A, given the radiology technology that we have today. Now, I put to you, given these three scenarios, which do you think has the best prognosis uh, the, 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 and the worst, and therefore the other one would be in the middle? Well, we, um, we did a study here. And it turns out that, that, as the literature shows, that the situation in C does pretty well, but that B does the worst of these three situations. And in part, that's because all of these lesions around the tumor represent vascular invasion. So what we have termed the situation in B is an hepatocellular carcinoma with a surrounding serotomimetic growth pattern. And this is an important feature because it portends a really um, dismal prognosis in terms of high probability of recurrence of the hepatocellular carcinoma 
as opposed to A. And this is really important, of course, because this will predicate whether the patient may undergone further chemotherapy, further HCC, or just to give some understanding of what's going to happen long term. So this type of evaluation is done on pathology, and that's where we play a critical role. So assuming one gets to the wait list, um, in this country, there are, for liver transplantations, um, 12,000 patients waiting for a liver, again, with a mean wait time of three years, and because the donor livers are really a scarce resource. So the selection of a donor is based upon two processes. One, there are, if you're an organ donor and, and you undergo, you die, you can, your organs are donated. And so I'm certainly an organ donor. So that's the cadaveric organ donor. And these can be broken down into, quote, beating and non-beating based upon uh, the, the status of the heart once they procure the organ. And then there's the situation of living donors. So living donors do represent part of the donor pool for liver transplantation patients, although it's a, it's a very much a min minority. Unlike kidney transplantation, with liver transplantation patients, there doesn't have to be a lot of HLA matching. And so the liver is actually from a tolerance standpoint and transplantation, fairly robust in terms of, of, of that immune non, uh, having to take into account that HLA the way that it's done, it's done with kidneys. Now, I'm showing you this diagram to show you the cadaveric situation. The patient dies or an organ donor. And how, how do we decide who, who's eligible to get that liver? Well, we have a national organization here, UNOS, which, which sets the rules for that allocation. The old method by which they did that was based upon where you lived and the geography. And so if you lived in the yellow zone, anybody that died there and was an organ donor, if you lived in that zone, you might be eligible for liver in that zone. But if you could not get an organ from, say, the blue zone or the red zone or the gray zone. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you think about it, because you could be living right next to the blue zone and there'd be a donor liver that's right next door. So the uh, UNOS recognized that situation. And what they do now is rather than in terms of these regions, they look at things as actually a sphere. And basically, it's determined that the epicenter from where the organ donor is, that the length, how many miles away that you are from that, coupled with your MELD score, how bad your liver disease is, is going to dictate where on the waiting list you are and your eligibility for that organ. So this is, I think, definitely a step in the right direction in terms of trying to be fair in allocating this limited resource. So our role in terms of liver transplant pathology is to determine the underlying liver disease, but we also play a role in assessing the donor liver. And this also often happens late at night, early in the morning, at three in the morning. And what happens is an organ liver is procured and we are asked to determine a few things. And we do this on frozen sections. So on frozen section of the donor liver, we're asked to determine how much steatosis is, is present. Are there any other things going on in the liver? And the reason for that is that the variables that impact outcome, the short-term outcome of that new liver are the degree of macrofascicular steatosis. The more fat you have in the liver, the less well you will do short in the short run, as well as the cold ischemic time. That is how, how long the, the liver has been out of the, uh, the donor body. Those are the big factors that dictate short-term outcome. Donor age is taken into account, 
but it doesn't affect the long-term outcome. It doesn't affect the short-term outcome. It affects mostly the long-term outcome in terms of regenerative ability of the liver. So the older donors don't have as much regenerative ability in their liver as, say, a younger donor does. And the reason I show you graphically here of why the degree of steatosis is so important is the function over time is shown here. So if you have a lot of fat in your liver steatosis, the orange line, it, it really fails quickly. The green line is a little more fat um, or less fat as a medium. And then you know, less fat, you do pretty well. So the steatosis is really an important feature. And it is, again, one of the most important factors in determining allograft function post-transplantation. And I'll show you the mechanism by which the steatosis affects its function. I also want to show you that the degree of steatosis affects short-term function, but not long-term. And specifically, it has no bearing on the probability of rejection. A key point to keep in mind it is that it's macro, not microfascicular steatosis, the feature that we are evaluating. So let's take a look here. Here are three situations. One is a fatty liver, 90% steatosis. One is 50%, one is 5%, and one has basically no steatosis. Well, what is the cutoff for the percent steatosis that we usually look for? The studies have shown that if you have steatosis and approximate macrofascicular steatosis in more than a third of your hepatocytes, that is a bad prognostic feature in terms of short-term allograft failure. So one third is, is the number that we use. Also importantly, it's not the area of the steatosis, but it is the proportion of fat content of the hepatocytes. That is the number of hepatocytes or percentage of hepatocytes that have macrofascicular steatosis. And this gets tricky because a lot of people, when they look at the slide, say, oh, it looks like there's a lot of space. I think it's, you know, got 90% steatosis. But if you were to actually count the number of cells and do the percentage, it's not as bad as first thought. So, Macrofascicular steatosis is the most important thing, not micro. And I show you in a cartoon fashion what macro looks like on the upper left versus microfascicular steatosis. On real life, here's what macrofascicular steatosis looks like, and as opposed to microfascicular steatosis. That being said, it's not always that simple. There's really a gradient of micro going into macro. You have to be able to just set your threshold of distinguishing micro and macro fascicular steatosis. It's not really cut and dry, as you can see here. Now, you would, might think that, well, why should we have to do a frozen section to determine the degree of steatosis? Can't the can we just assess the body mass index and shouldn't that correlate with a degree of steatosis? Well, it turns out no. So patients with a high BMI may have no steatosis and therefore may be um, organ donors. So it's really the histologic frozen section evaluations. We can't use BMI. Okay. Now, why does the percentage of hepatocytes with steatosis affect the liver short term. Well, I'll show you that what happens is that with free radical generation, once the blood is hooked in again, you get an ischemic reperfusion type injury. And so here's the cartoon now of our liver. So the yellow represents macrofascicular steatosis and all the hepatocytes that we have here. It's taken out, put in, and then the blood flow starts again. And with the ischemic reperfusion injury, with the generation of free radicals, the endothelial cells become damaged, they slough off, and they start to bunch up, and they actually physically impede blood flow through the sinusoids. So you basically get a problem with blood flow through your liver based upon that endothelial injury. 
and that is directly related to the degree of macrovesicular steatosis. Now, cold ischemic time also plays a role. And again, that's how long the organ has been out of the donor, the cadaveric, cadaveric donor. So if it's a non-marginal donor, i.e. they have no steatosis, the cold ischemic time really doesn't play too much in terms of the short-term outcome of that liver. Whereas if there's a lot of steatosis, the cold ischemic time is an incredibly huge factor that will dictate the function of that liver uh, short-term post-operatively. So these are the variables that are taken to, to account by the transplant surgeon when we evaluate the degree of steatosis. And I show you here not only short-term outcome, but even the longer-term outcome in terms of months is that the marginal donor, a lot of steatosis, does not do very well at all. Okay, so let's practice this. Here's our case, and I show you again what we're looking at, macrofascicular steatosis versus microfascicular steatosis. And again, it's the percentage of the hepatocytes with macrofascicular steatosis. So if you just look at this power, that might be a little bit difficult to assess. You could have a number in your head, okay? Let's look at higher power and take time to, to see which you would call macrofascicular and which you would call microfascicular. And again, it's sometimes it's incredibly difficult because one person may say, well, I think that's macro. Another person, well, I think it's micro. Again, you have to just set your own threshold. I would say just in this field right here that the percentage of hepatocytes with macrovesicular steatosis is definitely over one third. And even at a higher power here, if you were to count the hepatocytes and determine that percentage, I think you would approach 50% of macrovesicular steatosis hepatocytes. Okay, let's do another case. Here we have donor, we're doing a frozen section on it. And at this power, you can see even at low power, there doesn't seem to be much steatosis at all. There's a little. Um, and now we go at higher power, and there's basically two hepatocytes in this whole field that have macrofascicular steatosis. So this would definitely be a two thumbs up for further use in liver transplantation. The percent of steatosis here is very small. Let's do a third case. In this situation, we have some degree of macrofascicular steatosis. And again, from a percentage basis, maybe you could say, oh, it's 20%. We go down at higher power and look. So from that standpoint, could be a go in terms of liver transplantation. But then you start to notice some of the portal tracts on the right-hand side, and they look like they're involved with a, a lymphocytic chronic inflammatory process. So how does this play in terms of allocating this liver? Well, most importantly, it's also the degree of fibrosis, which is difficult to determine on frozen section, but clearly if it's cirrhosis, we should be able to uh, determine that. This, by, this liver was used for liver transplantation. The degree of steatosis was fine for that. And the little portal inflammation may be due to hepatitis C. So they use hepatitis C donors for patients that have un undergone um, hepatitis, that have hepatitis C, so we, we can do that because right now the treatments are so effective for hepatitis C, we take advantage of that donor population. And here at higher power, again, to show you the inflammatory infiltrate in the portal tract and fairly minimal steatosis. Okay. So finally, our patient is able to undergo liver transplantation surgery. Now, at this point, the surgeon has to determine what type of anastomosis they are going to make. And specifically, the determination is what type of biliary anastomosis are they going to make. Patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis or those rare patients with cholangiocarcinoma of the extrapatic bile duct, they will not undergo a bile duct to bile duct anastomosis. And I'll show you that anastomosis later. But everyone else undergoes a bile duct to bile duct anastomosis. So the type of anastomosis in the biliary tree is dictated by what the 
underlying liver disease is. So whether it's a duct to duct anastomosis or basically a small bowel to the excavated hilum type of somewhat of a high type pre procedure is dictated on whether or not the patient has sclerosing cholangitis or there's rare situations of cholangiocarcinoma that may be eligible for transplantation. Now, some of the time, however, their understanding of what the native liver disease is prior to transplantation does not um, correlate with what we diagnose after thorough examination of the native liver post-transplantation. So this does happen occasionally. Okay, so now let's get back to our liver patient. That they've gotten a liver transplantation. That's great. Let's take a look at some of the time course of issues that may arise and how we go about evaluating them. So acute rejection is a problem. Uh, graft failure, of course, is a problem. We talked about the degree of steatosis. And as I discussed at the beginning, there are features very early on in the liver that dictate long-term outcome. And specifically in the, what is determined to be a time zero liver biopsy, that is after they've hooked up the new liver to the blood system and then they take a biopsy, there are features within that liver biopsy that are important biomarkers for the probability of subsequent acute rejection within the first three months. And we found that pedicellular swelling was important and that actually inversely correlated was the number of apoptotic hepatocytes. And I think that's interesting in terms of hypothesizing some key biologic mechanism. And that necrosis and hemorrhage within that post-reperfusion liver dictated a high probability of graft failure within the first three months. So we developed features that were predictive therein. So rejection, recurrent disease, and acquired disease are really now, at this point in our patients' travels, are the things that we are worried about. So here, let's take a look at this case here. Here, this patient underwent a liver transplantation, and uh, a week after they got the liver transplantation, their liver just was not functioning at all, and they started to go into liver failure, necessitating retransplantation. This is a cut surface of that liver, and let's see what happened to this particular patient. Here I give the model of our liver with a portal triad, hepatocyte uh, cords, and the terminal venule. And remember that the hepatic artery is the sole blood supply to the bile duct, whereas the hepatocytes get a dual blood supply from the hepatic artery and the portal venous branch. So what happened in this situation is that there was an hepatic arterial thrombosis because the anastomosis had some problem that led to basically bile duct infarction shown here. And by having that thrombosis in the hepatic artery, the blood supply cannot get to the bile duct. It then undergoes necrosis, leading to that bile duct infarct with the bile just spewing throughout the liver. And this necess is, necessitates a redo for the liver transplantation. So that may happen early on within the first year and later, but the most probable time is within the first year we worry about and have to evaluate for acute cellular rejection. Acute cellular rejection is a cellular, i.e. lymphocytic infiltrate, that is targeting the liver allograft. And there are differential compartments that are attacked by the immune system. The most probable is the bile duct compartment, the second is the central vein, and the third is the, the artery. That's a rare situation. Note that I'm not even pointing to the portal venous branch because that situation of having lymphocytes or endothelialis in the portal vein can be seen in so many situations 
it is not as sensitive, nor is it a specific feature for acute cellular rejection. So I rely on these three compartments and specifically the bile duct and the terminal venule. So let's take a look at a case here. Here's a liver biopsy. And this is uh, three months post-transplantation. And in this portal track, it's even hard to find the bile duct. But I show you a circle here where the bile duct is. And on higher power, we'll see that it's infiltrated by lymphocytes with epithelial damage. But importantly, in determining whether, whether there's a recurrent hepatitis or not, note the lack of real interface activity in terms of those lymphocytes. They are portal tract centered and attacking the bile duct. So here in higher power is our bile duct. And here it is again. It's, it's hard to find with all the lymphocytes. And it, we show that there is intraepithelial lymphocytes with bile duct damage as shown by irregular nuclear spacing and cytoplasmic vacuolization. That is acute rejection of the bile duct type. Here's another situation here. So even hard to find the bile duct here because it's, it's infiltrated by so many lymphocytes. But you have to take time to find it. And you can show here that it's damaged by the intraepithelial lymphocytes. Do not let your eye go to a bile duct that looks fine and forget about finding the one that is hard to find that is damaged. Now, acute cellular rejection can be treated nicely by increasing the immunosuppression regime. And so it can go from acute rejection to pretty much a normal state. The other compartment of acute cellular rejection is the terminal venule. And I show you here the histology of that form of acute cellular rejection. You have hemorrhage, there's lymphocytes around the terminal venule, and it's this flame-shaped injury to the terminal venule. That is acute cellular rejection of the central vein. Now, that may happen alone, so-called isolated central venulitis, or it may happen in association with portal tract or bile tuck type acute rejection. So they're not predicated to be um, joined at the hip, so to, so to speak. You can have isolated central venulitis, which is a form and should be treated of acute cellular rejection. So at higher power, to show you the lymphocytes that are just blowing away the terminal venule with the hemorrhage and the lymphocytes as shown. Now, you might think that, well, why should we even do a liver biopsy for consideration of acute cell rejection? Shouldn't the liver associated enzymes be a good marker for determining acute cellular rejection? Well, the answer is no. And uh, that's unfortunate. We, we did do that study a while ago. I give you the reference but there was no single parameter or, or combinatorial uh, parameters that correlate with acute cellular rejection in the liver biopsy. So one cannot use those as a diagnostic feature of acute cellular rejection. Here's another case, patient status post liver transplantation, maybe six months ago. And you can see there's two portal tracts shown here. The bile duct in each of those it's okay. It's maybe a little injured, but it doesn't fulfill the criteria for acute rejection. But I think you'll note the portal tract in the upper left, if you look at the portal venous branch, that it's not one circle. It's three circles. And there, therefore, this represents damage to the portal vein branch within the portal tract. I show you this because to make the point that injury of the portal venous branch within the liver is not a feature of acute rejection and has no long-term outcome. This portal trachinopathy, as we'll call it, that I show you here, we looked at that situation in the liver transplant population and compared it to the non-liver transplant population. And the hypothesis was that if there is cellular rejection of the portal venous branch, that it would result in portal trachinopathy. And so we looked in patients that did not have liver transplantations and those that did and determine the 
prevalence of portal tract venopathy, and it turns out they were the same percentage. So therefore, portal tract venopathy was not enriched in the liver transplant population, lending credence to the concept that portal vein involvement is not a sensitive nor even specific feature for acute cellular rejection in the liver. Okay. Now, let's look at this case. This patient underwent liver transplantation. I'm not telling you what the underlying disease is for the moment, but what we can see here is that the portal tract is really infiltrated with lymphocytes and there is a vague histiocytic granulomatous reaction around the bile duct. Granulomas are not part of acute cellular rejection at all. This patient underwent liver transplantation for primary biliary cholangitis. And so with this portal tract, I would not diagnose acute cellular rejection. I would diagnose recurrent primary biliary cholangitis. However, if in the same biopsy, I found this in the terminal venules, this patient, yes, they have recurrent primary biliary cholangitis, but they also have acute rejection. Central venulitis is never seen in primary biliary cholangitis. Central venulitis is acute cellular rejection, possibility of autoimmune hepatitis that can be seen in that situation. And in rare situations, it's a form of acute graft-versus-host disease. The point being that it is, needs to be treated with immunosuppression. It should not be ascribed to medications, drugs, or any viral or other hepatitides at all. It is, in this situation, acute cellular rejection. So I discussed that the choice of a bile duct anastomosis is predicated on whether or not the patient, in part, has primary sclerosing cholangitis. So folks with primary sclerosing cholangitis, there are two situations for the bile duct anastomosis and liver transplantations. A is the usual adduct to duct anastomosis, but B represents the type of anastomosis in patients with PSC. And that is they take a loop of small bowel and do somewhat of a modified Kasai procedure to have the bile drain directly into the small bowel. You don't want to have a duct to duct anastomosis given that the extrapatic ducts are diseased to begin with. Well, why is that important? Well, here we have a post-transplant liver biopsy and someone that underwent liver transplantation for primary sclerosing cholangitis. And what you see here is on the left-hand side, the bile duct, it's not involved with acute rejection, but you can see that onion, onion uh, skin type of fibrosis. So, Oh, are you thinking this represents recurrent primary sclerosing cholangitis? Well, you'll read in the literature that some people think that that can recur. I believe, however, that we can't really make that determination. And the reasoning is this. Remember that the anastomosis is the small bowel directly to the biliary system. And with that type of anastomosis, the bile ducts have access to all the luminal contents of the small bowel, including bacteria. Here is a redo, i.e. the patient had a transplant for PSC, the patient was failing, they took the liver out and put in another one. And on this, you can see all the biliary sludge and the bile ducts, typical for primary sclerosing cholangitis. However, on histology, it was all intermixed with bacteria. So this, to me, is a secondary sclerosing cholangitis. And I do not think that we can, at this point, determine whether true primary biliary cholangitis recurs or does not recur, because I think most of these may be attributable to a secondary cholangitic state. So to recur or not to recur, this is really important in, in evaluating our patients post-transplantation. So autoimmune hepatitis, does that recur? Yes. And actually, patients with autoimmune hepatitis also have an increased risk for acute cellular rejection. Mushroom poisoning, does that recur? Well, no, assuming the patient doesn't take the same poison mushroom. Hemochromatosis, if you put in a new liver in a patient with hemochromatosis, 
may that recur in the liver? Well, the answer is yes, because the defect actually is at the level of the small bowel in terms of the regulation of iron absorption um, from enteral feeding. Does Wilson disease recur? Well, no, because the defect is in copper export into the biliary system in the liver. So you put in a new liver, the patient's not going to have Wilson disease anymore. Of course, if they have problems in terms of neuronal and other things from Wilson disease, it's not going to cure that. But they will not technically have Wilson disease. Alpha-1 antitrypsin disease deficiency, will that recur? Well, no, because the liver is the source of alpha-1. So you put in a new liver, assuming it doesn't have the deficiency, and you have now repleted the patient with alpha-1. Primary biliary cholangitis. Yes, I showed you an example of its recurrence. Primary sclerosing cholangitis. I think that's debatable. I think most of it may be attributable to a secondary cholangitic state. Fatty liver disease. Absolutely. Fatty liver disease, either non-alcoholic or, or alcoholic, definitely may recur in the liver allograft. And here I show you an example of pretty severe steatohepatitis, the prototypical chicken wire pattern of fibrosis. Hepatitis C, does that recur? Well, about 10 or more years ago, hepatitis C recurrence was a huge problem, and it would cause hepatitis and fibrosis within the liver and in a really rapid fashion in many patients, and it was a real problem. Except now, with, the, with our new medical treatment for hepatitis C, it is not so much of a recurrent problem at all because this medication will eradicate the hepatitis C. So it is not the recurrent problem that it was in the past. Let's take a look at this case. Here we have a portal tract. You can see the veins are a little bit abnormal. There's lymphocytic infiltrate. But I challenge you to find the bile duct and you won't be able to because the bile duct is missing. What I want to also bring to your attention is that there's no bile ductual proliferation around the edges of the portal tract. This is an example of late chronic ductopenic rejection. The risk factor for chronic rejection is acute rejection. And when there has been a decreased number of bile ducts greater than 50% loss, we then term this late chronic ductopenic rejection. It's not a mystery. It follows from acute rejection. And therefore, again, to make the point that acute rejection and chronic rejection, in terms of their temporal graphical uh, probability, coincide. We, in terms of chronic rejection, <coughs> we distinguish early and late rejection, chronic rejection. Late rejection in the bile ducts is loss of 50% or more. And in the terminal venules, late chronic rejection of the terminal venules is basically central to portal bridging. Early rejection, chronic rejection of the terminal venules is anything short of central to portal bridging fibrosis. The arteries can undergo accelerated atherosclerosis, which is a form of chronic rejection. Early chronic rejection of the bile ducts shows that they have abnormal shapes and are distorted. Now, the reason for making this distinction is that we still don't know if the patient has early chronic rejection of the bile ducts. Is that, does that dictate that, the pro, that over time they're going to lose the bile ducts? I, I think those studies are not quite in yet. So let me show you the histology of each of these forms of chronic rejection. Again, to make the point that chronic rejection is most probable within the first year post-transplantation. I show you ductopenic rejection. And again, note the lack of bile ductual proliferation. I show you terminal venular chronic rejection with fibrosis in the terminal venular area. And I show you the accelerated atherosclerosis within the hepatic artery branch. And normally you don't see that on the liver biopsy. It would be mostly in, a, in the large hepatic artery on, on a redo of liver transplantation. Okay. Okay. Um, 
the um okay. here i show you early chronic rejection of the biliary type and note that the bile duct is there but its shape is very distorted and this is called early chronic rejection of the bile duct type here again to show you that fibrosis in the terminal venule with acute rejection it follows from acute rejection and if you have acute rejection of the terminal venule you always have some degree of fibrosis hence chronic then this is also acute rejection with some element here of early chronic rejection of the central venular compartment so we have gone through the time period of our patient with liver disease brought up how they come to recognition their evaluation made the point about that the liver is a very scarce resource in terms of allocation for liver transplantation and brought up some of the various problems that may happen in patients with liver transplantation. And with that, I will close. Thank you, Dr. Ford, for this very illuminating discussion on different aspects of liver transplantation, starting from the basics all the way to the pathology, as well as different types of rejection and recurrences and everything. That's uh, really, really quite a lot for all of us. Definitely, we learned. I'm trying to see if uh, we have some questions online. Uh, I don't see exactly any question right now. So I wanted to ask you one thing, like, I mean, if this seems like a very basic one for you, like, uh, so just when you say chronic rejection and you say that chronic rejection mostly occurs within one year. So there is nothing related to that timeline when we call something as chronic rejection. Is that it? Correct. So the diagnosis of chronic rejection is based solely on the features in the biopsy. It has nothing to do with the timeline post-transplantation. Right. And some, that the same goes true for uh, acute rejection as well, isn't it? Yes, acute, acute rejection is defined by the histologic features in terms of lymphocytes attacking the bile duct and or terminal venular compartment. And that happens most probable in the first year, but it can happen years later. So um, it should not be uh, temporally related to say, well, I'm five years out. I can't possibly have acute rejection. That's, that's not the case. It can happen. Right, right. So that means that it's both acute and chronic is based on purely histology. So even after five years, you can have acute rejection based on histologic findings. And on the other side, even like, you know, as early as say one year, you can have chronic rejection based on histology. Is that right? Th that is absolutely correct. Okay. No, thanks for clarifying. There is one question I see online. Uh, Lorenzo is asking from Italy. So the question is, do you use C4D immunohistochemistry in the setting of chronic rejection? Okay, that's a very good question. The use of ancillary immunohistochemical markers, protect, particularly C4D for complement activation. We do not use that um, for the diagnosis of any form of rejection. It's based purely on the H and E. Right. I don't see any other question here. I think Yorinda uh, got the answer for his question. And thank you, Yorinda, for asking this question for Dr. Ford. So there is another question I can see. Uh, delayed acute rejection, does it have the same histologic feature as <coughs> usual acute cellular rejection? That's another very good question. When acute <coughs> rejection happens years later post-transplantation, well, it does affect the bile duct and or terminal venular compartment. When it affects the, the bile duct and the portal tract, it may have a more of an interface activity, look more like a hepatitis in addition to the duct injury. So yes, sometimes it does have a little different phenotype. Okay. I hope uh, 
your con un your answer uh, addresses the question for Imrahar. I'm not very sure. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Fart, for this illuminating lecture, and thanks to all our viewers for joining in and showing support to our effort to spread the pathology knowledge base. And Dr. Fart, you would be so happy to hear that you had viewers from so many different time zones, and I could see at least uh, viewers from 17 different countries who defied time zones to listen to your lecture. And thanks everyone for your support, and uh, a special shout out to Caroline from Tanzania, Salmi from Malaysia, Ajiki from Nigeria, Uzwal from Nepal, Powell from Poland. I have seen them for the first time, I think. And Kemnit from Cambodia. So thank you as always. So please follow our Facebook page, Twitter handle to be in touch with all the upcoming lectures. We will stay, we will keep you all posted and please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow the Facebook page and support our venture. Thanks again, Dr. Fart. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.